ಪೂತಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ನಮೋಟ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ನಮೋಟ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ಬುಂದಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಚಿ ಗಮ್ಮಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಚಿ ಸಂಗಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಚಿ ದ್ಯುತಿಯ ಬುಂದಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಚಿ ದ್ಯುತಿಯ ದಮ್ಮಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಚಿ ದ್ಯುತಿಯ ಸಂಗಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಚಿ ತತಿಯ ಬುಂದಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಚಿ ತತಿಯ ದಮ್ಮಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಚಿ ತತಿಯ ಸಂಗಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚ್ಚಿ So friends welcome to this uh, e- Wednesday evening uh, dhamma discussion or review of the suttas uh, a combination of of that So this week I hope you're all able to uh, look at the uh, the links to the the previous talk or the attachment i sent out on the insight knowledges now these uh insight knowledges uh are kind of eight or nine in number it's eight actual insight knowledges but the ninth is conformity i'll explain more about that later but these comprise a part of the ratta vinita sutta so last week we went over the relay of chariots and <clears throat> the uh the sixth of those stages of the relay of chariots was knowledge and vision of the way uh and so these uh knowledge and vision of the way are these uh, n- uh eight or nine insight knowledges and then the the last step of the ratna vinita ratna vinita sutta is the purification by knowledge and vision which comes after these insight knowledges now i know it may sound a little uh, difficult or you know there's a lot <laughs> uh, can be confusing <clears throat> so it takes uh, some time in studying that uh, to have it more clearly so we've gone over these insight knowledges before but this is considered the advanced stages of vipassana meditation and and a lot of people talk about mindfulness of course mindfulness is the popular form of meditation that day but a lot of the, the normal mindfulness practice doesn't even reach the level of insight uh, knowledges uh, because a lot of people don't practice it a uh, Uh, long enough for a continuous level with the appropriate levels of concentration to be able to even begin these uh, properly begin the insight uh, knowledges so you know before the uh, the insight knowledges just to have a quick review the you know the, the stages in purification or the purification of the sila and purification of the the mind which means attaining some stage of concentration 
and the purification of view. Uh, and that's the beginning of kind of ordinary or intellectual understanding about the five aggregates. And then it's purification by overcoming doubts, which means a deeper study of the Paticca Samapada and the forward and backward reverse order uh, to understand, at least intellectually, the idea about no self. And then there's the uh, discerning what is the the right path and the wrong path. And then the knowledge and vision of, of the way. So <clears throat> having uh, gone through or developed those previous uh, five stages of the, according to the Rata, Rata Vanita Sutta, then these insight knowledges. Anyway, the first one is the insight into rise and fall. And this really becomes Vipassana meditation in particular. Up to this time, a person is practicing kind of just mindfulness, really. Even though they say it's Vipassana, it's probably just mindfulness. But anyway, that's another <laughs> technical argument. <laughs> but uh, So the rise and fall means clearly seeing how quickly uh, the different uh, mind moments or the, the moments of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking uh, arise and vanish very quickly. So up until this point, or through going through all these other stages of practicing four foundations of mindfulness and developing the right view and so on, uh, one can gain a, a, a lot of good insights, but this, uh, the knowledge of rise and fall really only will probably will occur when one has attained momentary concentration or even better yet, the first jhanic level of concentration. And the Buddha even mentioned that. So that means you have to turn up, you have to uh, increase the speed of noting things. So the brain in its ordinary uh, state of mind is very slow in recognizing things. And, uh, and that be, that's because of its attachment and clinging to the various things that are coming through our senses. You know, you hear a sound, you get carried away by it, you hear a sight or a smell, and we react to it. So a person cannot, when they're reacting like that, cannot observe uh, really the rise and fall at this level of uh, insight knowledge. So anyway, it means tuning in to each moment of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking uh, without uh, clinging or holding on to any of those. We see how they would just vanish very quickly, but it's because of the mind's holding on to a particular sense stimulation that we're not able to see things coming after that. So it already assumes that one has achieved a good level of concentration where it's not clinging and reacting. It's overcome the five hindrances and, and has become uh, attained a very clear state. So the, this is what is called really tuning in to the flow of impermanence is you see how quickly, it almost like a camera flash, something arises and vanishes with that speed of just, you know, like flashing a camera, or the, you know, the flash bulb on a camera going off. It, how it just arises and vanishes very quickly. So that's the kind of clear vision and concentrated focus that the mind is having at each moment of feeling a body sensation, uh, hearing a sound, uh, noticing a thought or an urge, one after another uh, at a very high speed. And it's also called sixth sense door awareness. That means one is no longer focusing on any particular object. And it's very open and expanded and can notice any of the senses, uh, the five physical senses in the mind, anything that vibrates the web that uh, 
that uh, uh, clarity of mind sees how quickly it arises and uh, vanishes. Now, to give her another example, uh, on a electrocardiogram, that's called a EKG. You know, have, have you seen the graphs of a, you know, electrocardiogram or a, a sonogram? You know how each fluctuation of sound is a is an up and down line. Am I right, or am I off track? Or let me see some nodding ahead. Or, okay, so you're all aware of those those lines going up and down. Well, that is what you see in this knowledge of rise and fall uh, between all the six senses, is each one of those is like a rise and fall. Each minute fluctuation of the brain wave is one of those uh, you know, up and downs, or on a sound, if you're doing a sound thing also. Each fluctuation of the voice would be uh, a rise and vanish. So that is the kind of clarity and magnification that the mind has uh, when one gains this knowledge of rise and fall. Uh, so it's not just ordinary impermanence, it's a very high octane level of, uh, of mental acuity or mental uh, clarity. And it's because the hindrances have been subsided by the attainment of the jhana and the go, uh, suppressing of the, the hindrances. That's what blocks the mind's ability to have this kind of vision. So anyway, one builds up that speed of noticing until it becomes very, very clear. Uh, and then the second of these stages is seeing the dissolution that all you see is them vanishing. You no longer can distinguish between arising and vanishing. It's, it's just vanishing. And that's similar to being outside on a clear night watching a meteor shower. I don't know how many of you have <laughs> done that, especially here in the, on the East Coast with you know, lots of light pollution. But uh, if you've ever seen a meteor shower, and you're looking up in the sky, and all you see is just the vanishing of a, a trace of light through the sky. You know, you didn't even see it start. You just saw the vanishing of it. So that's called the, the knowledge of dissolution when things start dissolving uh, from the mind. We no longer can identify anything because things haven't remained in the mind even more than just a fraction of a second uh, for the mind to remember anything about them or to form any uh, perceptions about them. So that's uh, the knowledge of dissolution is showing how things don't really ex don't have any existence. Uh, they don't last. Uh, so they're rising and falling, but this is even a, a faster uh, speed. It's just things are dissolution. And even this, at that time, the sense of the ego, the self will also dissolve because the mind is not clinging on to anything. And so it's a good, uh, it's the entry point for understanding emptiness as well, because the, nothing has any substantiated uh, existence. It's just a momentary uh, vibration. And so this uh, gives rise to the third uh, of the insight knowledges is called the appearance of terror. Now, because of this deep insight, and you see how everything is just, has been created by the mind through attachment, uh, we understand how we've been duped our whole life uh, through this conditioned mind, through our clinging and identification, even to the sense of I and so on, that we've been trapped in this illusion the illusion of self and the illusion of substantial of, of permanence. So, and so this knowledge of rise and fall really cuts through the perception of per, uh, permanence and sees the impermanence. That's really when you understand what 
impermanence is, not just knocking over a, a glass and it breaks and you say, oh, a Nietzsche. You know, that, that's a very uh, uh, simple form idea about impermanence and not the real impermanence. So uh, it's this impermanence of the each moment of the, the mental states. So anyway, uh, the appearance of terror is not that you're really afraid of it, you're actually appalled by uh, the ignorance that has been in your mind and that is still in your mind when you're not in, you know, in deep meditation. And so, uh, and the simile of given is this, the simile given for the appearance of terror is like some strong men uh, dragging a person toward a, a burning charcoal pit. So there's a, a fire pit with embers in it. And the people are dragging this person, threatening to throw him into the pit. Now that person would be terrified, wouldn't it? Because he's afraid of getting burned or killed. So in the same way, when we have that deep insight, how, how we've been duped and conned by the conditioned mind and by conditioning and how that has kept us in the prison of suffering over and over again, that is where you know you're terrified of of the ignorance. You're not terrified of the world and, and the things of the world. No, you're you're terrified of the ignorance and the clinging, and the karmic web that the mind has weaved uh, uh, within the the world of the senses. So, and then the next. Uh, so that's an initial kind of reaction. This being terrified at. Have, have, have you know remaining stuck in the, the ignorant mind and and the defilements you know stuck in that. So then you know gradually as uh, you go on meditating, that that terror kind of mellows out and becomes a knowledge of danger. So that's a less intense state, but it's more deeply in ground. In ground, uh, ingrained in the in the consciousness. Now the danger is simile is similar to once the man is dragged to the charcoal pit, but then the people let let go of him. And, uh, and but now he knows that the the charcoal pit is a dangerous place, so he gives it space. He doesn't walk too close to it. So he's no longer terrified by it, but he simply has this knowledge that if I go too close to that pit, I'm going to get burned. So he, he gives it the distance. And that's what creates the mind. That's what actually allows the mind to pull away from its, uh, its attraction to the marks of beauty, its attraction to uh, sensual pleasures or even the aversion to them as well. So uh, that stage of the that fourth insight knowledge of the knowledge of danger, it gives rise to dispassion. So dispassion now is that detachment. And it's it's the, the mind losing all interest in uh, you know the sensual world. It doesn't mean that you still might have things but you no longer have that uh, sort of attachment to them you could uh, you know not have any uh, attachment or aversion this this passion and that also leads to uh, 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 equanimity so that uh, that this passion is the fifth of these insight uh, knowledges and it's it's a, it's a deeper level of detachment. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I'm not attached to this, I'm not attached to that. Uh, but that's probably a superficial uh, level of uh, sort of detachment. Uh, but the dispassion is, a, th this, these insight knowledges work on the unconscious mind, where previous types of knowledges and insights work on the, on the surface part of the mind. The insight knowledges are going very, very deep into the uh, deeper levels of the unconscious <clears throat> and causing uh, changes there. 
And so this dispassion uh, leads to the, the sixth of these insight knowledges, which is the desire for deliverance. That means now you're, you have a strong desire to want to be you know, delivered. Again, it's from ignorance that we want to be delivered, not through the things of the world. Let the, let the world be the world, but our mind is no longer uh, you know, uh, attracted to them so much. And the desire to be uh, de delivered from the web of karma. Basically, it's the web of karma that our mind has been creating, you know, that inner tangle and the outer tangle. Basically, it's the inner tangle. You know, in the beginning, you practice detaching from the outer tangle. Now, these insight knowledges are disentangling the inner tangle, which means the tangle of the, uh, the unconscious mind. <clears throat> so it's being that, uh, that desire for deliverance is going much deeper to a very deeper unconscious uh, level. And then that manifests also in your waking life, you know, when you're out of meditation, your mind is no longer attracted. You could be walking down a street, and you know, the, you know how the eyes you know, tend to want to dart to look at something. <laughs> The, the eyes probably wouldn't do that anymore. So there's this kind of a detachment. And then the seventh, so that desire for deliverance then leads to reflection. So the seventh of the insight knowledges is called ref, knowledge of reviewing. So you review everything that you've you've been doing up to this point over and over and over again. You're reviewing Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, over and over and over again from every uh, possible angle until, you know, one overcomes all uh, doubts. And, uh, you know, overcoming doubts is one of the hallmarks of entering the stream. Uh, and that comes in the next couple of stages. So anyway, uh, reflection just means it can... You're continuing your meditation and you're just hammering this dispassion and de that desire for the deliverance deeper and deeper uh, into the, the mind. And then that reflection leads to equanimity. Then you attain what is called Sankara Upeka. And that means the mind is no longer going out toward any of the uh, s s uh, sense stimulations or any of the five uh, aggregates. And that equanimity is equal to the equanimity that you attain in the fourth jhana. So that's why reaching these levels requires that, that jhanic level of concentration to reach these uh, deeper levels. And if you can maintain that level of equanimity long enough, then, so equanimity is the eighth of these uh, insight knowledges. And then there's a ninth one that's called conformity. And that means the mind is now starting to conform to the Dhamma. And it's conforming to the truth. So what is the truth? Everything is impermanent and everything is no self. And so the mind actually, that's when the sense of I and self starts to uh, fade away. I mean, you can experience the fading away to many, many different degrees. But at this level, I mean, it's like it's re reaching the, the uh, almost the ultimate level. Because the next stage is actually the experience of entering the stream, uh, or the you know the first stage of uh, enlightenment. Now, the, this conformity knowledge. So the mind is conforming to the truth. That means the sense of self is fading away. And the next stage would be the actual attainment of entering the, the stream. And there's a little simile given if you read the, the text uh, on the uh, insight knowledges that I had sent out. There was a simile of uh, a fruit bat. 
because the, the Buddha, so many things in the sutras, you know, the, the, the similes and analogies come through observing, you know, nature and animals and nature and things like that. So a fruit bat landed on a tree thinking, oh, there's going to be some fruit on this tree. So he goes to one branch, like he goes to the, the five aggregates, he goes to one branch and uh, there's, no, there's no good fruits here. This is no fruit. So he goes to another branch, oh, there's no fruits here goes to another branch. He goes to all the branches in a tree and he realizes, yes, this tree is useless. There's nothing that's going to satisfy uh, my uh, desire. So the, the, the fruit bat then starts going straight up out of the tree up to the top, following the main trunk of the tree. That means he's conforming. Now he's absolutely convinced there's nothing in that tree is going to give him any satisfaction. And so he decided, I'm out of here. And so he runs up the branch and pokes his head out of the treetops. And <clears throat> that's the conformity. That means the mind is now experiencing that state of emptiness. And then the next stage is actually he lets, lets his little feet off that last branch at the top and flies into the air. Uh, but that conformity knowledge, it means that the bat is absolutely convinced that there's nothing in that tree worth holding on to. And he's making the exit, exit stage left, uh, as, this, as they say <laughs> in the movies or whatever. So. That's the conformity knowledge that the mind is conforming to the truth. That means the last trace of the sense of self is starting to dissolve. And the analogy that I like to give uh, a lot is the simile of the ice cube. So if you have an ice cube, frozen ice cube floating in water, the ice cube thinks it's different from the water, right? But the ice cube is water, isn't it? It's just frozen water. So our sense of self is just a frozen bubble, you could say, within the mind that thinks it's a different from the ego consciousness is something different from uh, awareness or di different from the, all the other consciousness. So when that ice cube melts, then it becomes the water and there's no more duality. And so that's the same way with the, uh, the experience of that uh, you know, transcendence is that uh, that and, and that leads to the experience of you know emptiness or no self and the uh, the destroying of those three fetters of personality belief attachment to rites and rituals and doubts so. It's only at that moment that the doubts are seriously, uh, are totally overcome because there could be some, some residual doubts uh, about you know, whether there is a state of enlightenment that's, that's real or whatever the Buddha talked about was, was real uh, and so on. Or doubting about, oh, I'll never be able to do it Oh, my mind is so sunk in ignorance. But now you've traversed the path and you, you've had that experience and the, the doubts are transcended, are overcome. So anyway, uh, that is the, uh, just a, a review of those insight knowledges. And that is what is really called Vipassana meditation. If one is not doing that, it's just mind, it's more or less just mindfulness clear comprehension and, and so on. But at least from the, the Buddhist definition of uh, vipassana, because the, the word vipassana means seeing things separately. That means seeing each mind moment is a separate thing that arises and vanishes uh, from, from uh, everything else uh, that uh, we're experiencing. So it means uh, seeing that the real, the, 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 the way things are, that they're impermanent and without any owner or controller. So anyway, that's uh, what I wanted to uh, 
review in this uh, session now uh, if anybody has uh, some questions uh, we will uh, look at some of these questions now this first one see uh, Michael has put up a link to some other articles that also uh, talk about these uh, seven stages of, of purification if people want to uh, care to look at that later on. Okay, this second question. Uh, during meditation at times when concentration is strong, I can see many, many thoughts coming and vanishing. I'm astonished at the number of them, often differing opinions. And I can see their ending. They don't really, they don't really finish, just trail off. Is this how our mind is outside meditation? bombarded with uh, thoughts but we are we are attaching to some and ignoring the rest that's right you normally the mind clings on to the thought and runs with the thought so we don't see anything else that's coming and going behind it because our mind is now focused and being carried away in the thought or a sound or usually our thoughts will be about sound sights smells taste touches uh, memories and and so on so and we can see how they come and go but we're not seeing it in this very high speed uh, kind of vision of rise and fall it would uh, another good example of is a, a reel of film and the old uh, older movie reels uh, a movie is made up of individual frames with a still photo uh, with a little space in between where the gear of the uh, film projector uh, you know, rolls the film forward. But to make one, even just let's say to, to lift my arm up like that would require 25 or 30 or more individual frames to, to get that motion. And because it's running fastly. We don't see the spaces in between. But in this rise and fall, we're almost like you're seeing the spaces in between those frames of the movie. That is the real definition of the insight into rise and fall, uh, as seeing it uh, that way, you know, in that very deep uh, uh, state. Uh, but we can, you know, we can get a sense of the impermanence even without reaching that level. But that is, <laughs> that is, a, when you see it happening that fast, that uh, blows your mind, so to speak, <laughs> to use that old <laughs> cliche. Um, let me see. Who knows? So outside of meditation here, our mind doesn't have that clarity to detach from its, its thoughts. No, but in meditation, then you can. But in this state of deep vipassana, then you're seeing it at a, it's almost like a, it's similar also to a microscope. You know, in your ordinary world, you're seeing things without any magnification at all, if you, you know, with a microscope. But as you start to meditate, you start turning up the power like the power of five, and now you can you know, notice a few more things. And you turn it up to a power of 20, and a power of 50, and a power of 100. This Vipassana meditation is going to be like at least a 1,000 power or going to an electron microscope that you see the actual almost atomic molecular uh, speed of how uh, that vibration 
and that's why it's not, you know, it's it's not an easy thing to cultivate. And usually, pe people go on a retreat for for a few weeks or a month, in very intensive retreats to build up to that kind of a, a level. Um, Let's see if I can miss next question. Can one consider with reflection that comma in itself sooner or later fall into the wrong path while confirmation through Dhamma arises upon the right path? Uh, yes, of course. It's our wrong views and being caught in the web of kama uh, that keeps the mind in the wrong path. And that's why the right view, the purification of view is, is said to be the, the entryway to uh, uh, finding the right path. Uh, and it's our karma, yes, we're creating good karma. When you meditate, let's say a person's meditating for few years, five years, 10 years, 15 years or more, you know, their, their, their karma is changing as you do that and the mind is changing and you're purifying, you're going through these stages of purification of sila, purification of mind, uh, purification of view, that is also changing your karma because you're letting go of the negative actions and you're creating more wholesome actions that keep leading the mind uh, toward that right path. Uh, so it is, uh, it's, yeah, it's it's all connected with the, the kama. And we're, we're overcoming, transcending the negative kama that keeps the mind bound and suffering to creating the, the causes for the wholesome kama, which lead the mind uh, toward the dhamma more and more. Okay, now, uh, so that's uh, those chat messages. Okay, now I'm going to be, I wanna post that in here now. So how do I do that now? Oh, click it or paste it. Okay, friends, I'm going to be uh, uh, pasting a link That's not a live link, right? Yeah, it enter here? Let's press enter. Oh, okay. Okay, now uh, I wanted to uh, announce that, uh, you know, the first book I ever wrote on meditation, I wrote it in 1977, it's been out of print for many, many years, but now it's been uh, republished uh, by Amazon, uh, by the self-publishing. Somebody, one of our Dhamma friends, uh, took it upon themselves to, uh, to, uh, to do that. And uh, I only had one left uh, copy of that uh, here. Uh, and so, uh, and so it wasn't available for, but it's about the five aggregates, and it's about this kind of meditation. It's about the insight knowledges are also in that book, at the back of the book. And so it's really like, a, a, you know, it's a very power packed book. The title of it is Breaking Through the Self Delusion. And that's exactly what we were talking about in these, uh, in these insight knowledges and uh, how to meditate on the five aggregates. Uh, but it's, it's suttas, it's 80% uh, of it is, is quotations from the suttas uh, of the Buddha describing the, the five aggregates and other uh, aspects of uh, 
you know, developing this type of wisdom. So uh, if you're interested, uh, you can copy that, uh, that link and uh, Do you have a, a, a copy there? I want to show it. Yeah. I'm going to actually uh, put this, uh, the cover of this book. I don't know if you're, you can see that. Anyway, that is the. Uh... So, does anybody uh, have uh, any other questions on the Dhamma that you might like to ask? We still have a few minutes. What is the name of your book again, Bonte? Breaking. <laughs> Through the self delusion. Okay. Thank you. It's also, it's also the subtitle is a guide through vipassana meditation. Uh, Bante, can, you, yeah, can I ask one question? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's just. Uh, are these uh, uh, knowledges uh, all sequential, or uh, is there any possibility for them to uh, overlap one another? Like, if uh, somebody uh, has a knowledge of uh, um, a danger, uh, uh, can they be missing something before that stage? Well, there has to be a reason for danger. Danger doesn't arise that would for no reason. Uh, the, the danger arise because you see there's some pain or problem going to arise if you if you contact something, right? Yeah. So, uh, but normally these in all of the Buddhist teaching, all the lists like the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path seven factors of enlightenment, four foundations of mindfulness, these are seven stages of purification. These uh, are, yes, they're given in that order because one is a stepping stone uh, to the next one. Because a person is, it's like learning in our school, right? The average kid has to go to the first grade first. If he doesn't pass that, he's got to repeat it before he goes to the second and the third and the fourth and fifth, because except for we all hear about child prodigies, right? So that's one out of a, a million, you know, the seven-year-old go to Harvard or something, but uh, can bypass that. But for the, uh, the, you know, the average person, it's a way that we uh, prepare the mind for the next stage. So the next stage naturally unfolds, it's a natural, uh, progression of that. Uh, so, unless we understand suffering, we won't be able to understand the cause of suffering, we, but maybe only superficially, but not at the deepest levels. Thank you. So, sorry, so straight line the Spine and the back of the head, in a straight line. Gently close the eyes. Now focus your attention down to where the buttocks press the seat. Feel that sensation of hardness. The buttocks pressing in the seat. The 
feel the sensation go through the body feeling in different places try to feel the, the subtle sensations occurring in those areas turn up the power of the mental microscope now feel how the knees are bent and the legs and feet tucked underneath where the feet press the floor where the legs are crossed mentally remind yourself of sitting, sitting, body is sitting now in the present moment. Now feel your hands and fingers touching together, where they touch the leg. And feel the subtle Pulse in your hands or fingers. The sensation of warmth, tingling sensation. Now feel the weight of the arms hanging from the shoulders. Relax the shoulders. Feel the sensations of the clothing touching the skin of the shoulders, the arms, the chest. And just remember sitting, sitting. of your thoughts, just let the thoughts come and go in the back of the mind, let the sensations of the body in the front of the awareness, now feel the head balanced on top of the neck, check your chin, just keep your chin lifted up level with the floor. some sensations on your face, skin stretched over the face. Feel the lips touching together. Try to feel the tongue laying in the mouth. Tongue might touch the teeth. Now feel the eyes in the socket and the eyelid stretched over the eyeball. Try to gaze on the eyeball. Try the eye of awareness. The fleshy eyes see the outside world. The third eye of awareness. You see the world under the skin. You feel it. The subtle sensations of it. You can also see the thoughts going through the mind. Feel a point behind the eyes, let the awareness of the 
expand a little bit. You can feel the outline of the sitting body. The general sense of the sitting body. Head on top, the arms at the side, the hands, the buttocks and feet pressing the floor. Just try to hold that outline of the body in the mind's eye, the third eye. Remember sitting, sitting, sitting. Present moment awareness centered in the body. Now begin some deep, slow breathing again, like we did during the yoga. Two or three seconds. Expand the abdomen, rib cage, and upper chest, holding the air in two or three seconds. Feel that power. Feel the sitting body. Then try to feel the last bit of air go out of the lungs on the exhale. Just take a few more breaths like that. Cultivating this mindfulness and breathing in, letting go of the past and the future. And breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and the future. here and now. And breathing in, feeling the whole body. And breathing out, feeling the whole body. Now we're going to count the breaths from one to ten. I'll do the counting for you. Try to concentrate more on just the breathing. And at the next expanding in breath, mentally count to one. Hold the air in a couple seconds. And at the contracting out breath, also count to one. Feel the last bit of air go out. The next in breath, two. Out breath, two. And three. Out three. In four. Out four. In five. Out five. In six. Six. 
in seven. Out seven. In eight. In nine out nine in ten. And just continue the counting. Let the breathing return to its own control, a shorter, irregular rhythm. To continue to feel it, to keep your attention focused. Any any movements, subtler movements of the abdomen, rib cage, your chest. Try to feel the sensations of the clothing rubbing against the skin of the stomach, your cage, your chest as it expands and contracts. And make that the primary focus of your concentrated awareness. Knowing when the breath is coming in. by feeling it, feeling the subtle sensations, but not just one sensation, and turn up the power of the concentration, you'll be able to notice four or five or six different sensations are expanding, a brief pause. Several contractions, sensations of the contracting outburst. It's tuning into impermanence. You can make these brief mental notes to help keep the mind focused. In, in, sit, in. Out, out, sit, in. Just over and over and over again. In, in, sit, in. Out. Out, sit in. You can repeat the word two times because it's not just the one in breath, it's many short sensations. Sometimes you feel it the first part of the breath in the abdomen, the second part of the breath in the chest. Brief pauses between the breaths, feel the outline of the sitting body, keeping posture straight, chin lifted up, in, in, sit, in, out, out, sit, in. 
breath by breath, moment by moment. Just to tune in to the impermanence of each breath. The in-breath starts, lasts a moment or two and stops. Contracting out-breath starts, lasts a moment or two and stops. Even while the breath is lasting, you can feel a couple of different sensations. like a scientist sitting in the laboratory turning up the power of the microscope. In, in, sit, out, out. Special thoughts come and go in the back of the mind. With the sensations of the breathing body in the front of the awareness. Notice how each breath is different, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Sometimes you feel it more in the abdomen, sometimes you feel it more in the rib cage, the upper chest. It's always changing. between the breaths are sometimes longer or short. This change also is the impermanence. feeling the breathing, you might feel some chest pains or other sensations coming and going in or around the breathing awareness. Part of the impermanence. So many thoughts that the mind is sort of rousing. Go back and do some deep, slow breathing, but also centered in the body. Breathing in, 
Power of the mental microscope, more the subtler, finer details, sensations, the breathing body. Noticing subtler thoughts moving through the mind. Thoughts start to take the mind away, to alert to that, thinking, thinking, let go of the thought. Be connected with the breathing process. As you be alert, see how quickly certain sensations arise in the mind. Very quickly, how the sensations seem to last a little longer, and even while they're lasting, they're changing.
breathing in, sixteen. Breathing out, sixteen. Sensations come and go. Pleasure or pain come and go. Sounds come and go. Thoughts, ideas, urges come and go. Thoughts of I, me, or mine come and go. And they're all just the five aggregates of the body and mind and world more flow of impermanence of the sensing. Just beneath all of that change and impermanence, mental chaos, sleepiness, is the parallel dimension of the now, of the present moment of awareness. You lose that connection to the breathing body, to the present moment. The mind gets easily carried away. Thoughts and reactions based on the past or future. Cling on to any of the sensations coming through the senses or thoughts. These objects become our world, take over the mind of reaction. When we tune into the flow of impermanence, moment by moment, seeing the rise and fall the body-mind process. Just entering upon the right to be. The path of insight. Pains arise, we see also this current of sensations. It's not just one current of sensation, it's continually changing. 
infusion of the nourishing oil of Bhakti Kumara. Relaxing around this body irritation with painful sensation. Cultivating a detached onlooking awareness. This breathing body.
the thoughts or perception were triggered off by that sound vibration. Sabe Sankara Anichati Yada Panyaya Pasati Atani Bindati Dukhi Kesamabhigo Visu Dukkha patta cha nidukkha Vaya patta cha nidmaya Sokha patta cha nisokha Ponti sabli pipani All conditioned things, the five aggregates of this body, mind, and world are impermanent. They arise only to briefly last and vanish. When one sees this with the eye of insight, the eye of wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. This is the path to purity and freedom. And may the suffering be free from suffering. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. In this way, may all beings live with mindfulness and wisdom. And thus spoke the Buddha. Now I invite you to join in chanting the word Sabi three times slowly, maybe chanting on a long out breath and take another deep breath try to feel those vibrations in your body and mind take a deep breath so Sadhu Mindfully place your hands at the edge of your knees and take one more deep breath through the breathing in, stretch the head back and arch the spine backward. Hold it a few moments. And lift the head up on an in breath. And press the chin to the top of the chest on the out breath. And lift the chin up level on an in breath. And relax on the out breath. And put a smile on your face.
The reason why we put a smile on our face at the end of meditation, especially when you get some insights, is just you see that everything is impermanent. So any kind of suffering and problems you may have now, just understand that this too will pass, it will change. You don't have to cling too tightly to this, the, the bad aspects of it. Okay, friends, so I hope you had a few moments of some peaceful awareness, some insights. So we'll see you again maybe next week. Anybody have any last uh, questions or comments? Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Everyone have a good night. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Namo Buddhaya. Mm-hmm.